Good morning. My name is Ethan Rittenauer. I'm an educator here um, at the uh, Chiha Park and Zoo, the um, Flint River Aquarium, and the Throne of Tisca Heritage Center, which are all part of uh, what's known as the Artesian Alliance here in Albany, Georgia. And today I am coming to you from the Flint River Aquarium um, because I want to talk about something related to water, um, specifically related to oceans. I want to talk to you guys about ocean currents. Um, and so to begin, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, and uh, I entitled it Current Events because I love puns. Um, so the first question I want to ask is, how many oceans are there? Um, I want you to think about that for a little bit. Um, Whenever you're looking at this map, you can see we've got the Atlantic Ocean, we've got the Indian Ocean, we've got uh, the Pacific, which is over here and over here, and we also have the Arctic Ocean, and sometimes they they count an Antarctic Ocean, but when you really think about it, we really only have one ocean, because uh, it's all connected, every single aspect of it. Is connected. So there is no real distinction between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean over here, or the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic Ocean meets the Pacific Ocean over here. It meets it up here. The Arctic Ocean is really just a bunch of ice that all of the other oceans mingle with. Um, there is no distinction. It's all one ocean, right? Um, and so that's going to be important moving forward as we think about stuff, um, because that means that anything that happens, say, over here on the Georgia coast could affect something happening all the way over here on like the west coast of Australia or all the way up here in Kamchatka or um, what's going on, say, in uh, Colombia and uh, Bolivia and, and uh, any other place. Um, the oceans are all interconnected with each other and um, they all mix together, all of their waters. Um, the waters don't just sit still. If you've ever been to the ocean, you know that waves are constantly beating against the water. Um, ships are constantly moving around. The water's constantly turning and moving, which means that everything in the ocean is um, as well. Um, and I want to talk about maybe one of my favorite examples of this, um, Friendly Floaties. Friendly Floaties um, was a program um, to try to map um, ocean currents. Um, so in 1992, on its way from Hong Kong to Tacoma, Washington, a cargo ship um, spilled 28,800 rubber bath toys. They were ducks, frogs, and a couple other things, like little rubber ducks. Um, into the Pacific Ocean. The whole container just fell off. Um, and so all of these rubber ducks were released. Um, and somebody um, got the bright idea after a few washed up um, that they were going to start tracking them because all of these rubber ducks have tracking numbers, which means that you can tell um, where it came from. Um, so these rubber ducks and other rubber toys um, uh, you could track where they were. So if they washed up on shore, you could uh, contact um, somebody and, and they would now know that one of these rubber ducks made it to a location. Um, so using these tracking numbers, people were reporting um, where they washed ashore and when they washed ashore. Um, so the first ones that actually washed ashore were up in Alaska in 1992. And then a couple more showed up on the... Uh, um, coast of Russia, um, and some showed up on the western coast of the United States um, in a couple places. Um, some made their way over to Papua New Guinea and, and, uh, and Australia. Um, some, after several years, managed to find their way into, um, believe it or not, Nova Scotia and uh, uh, the northeastern United States, places like Maine and Massachusetts started um, to get them in the um, early 2000s. Um, South America saw a few off the coast. Um, they made their way into the Indian Ocean and were spotted in places like India at um, different points. And then um, uh, 
after 15 years, they even managed to end up off the coast of France. So that's pretty crazy. Um, they managed to make their way all the way to France um, from the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, and a whole bunch of them actually ended up in what's called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, and it's called that because there's the, just this huge, essentially just swath of plastic and garbage in the middle of the Pacific um, that kind of sits, it tends to sit right around here. And there's also another one that sits right over here. And it's because um, if you've ever seen like a river, you know how sometimes there's these little spots where there's little whirlpools and just a bunch of junk gets trapped there. The same sort of thing happens in the ocean because of currents, um, which we're gonna talk about a little bit more here in just a moment. But um, it was kind of eye-opening to see that, that um, something as small as a rubber duck um, in the Pacific Ocean um, made its way all the way over to, uh, to uh, France and India and pretty much everywhere, right? Um, I'm sure if we had um, tracking places off the coast of Antarctica, we would have found some there too. Um, so what exactly is a current? What do I mean whenever I say current? Um, well, um, oh, before we move forward, um, I've got a question and it's, can you still find rubber ducks today? Yeah, yeah. Um, they're not as common anymore because uh, a lot of them have been found already. Um, but um, it is still possible because not all rubber ducks were accounted for. It would still be possible for you to find a rubber duck off the coast today. Um, it'd be a lot more rare though. 1992 was uh, 29 years ago now. So, um, but what is a current? What do I, what do I mean whenever I say currents? Um, a current is, in its simplest terms, movement of water from one point to another. Um, there are two basic kinds of currents. There's horizontal current, which is whenever the water moves from side to side. And that's what we usually are referring to when we say current. And then any sort of vertical motion um, between currents is called up or downwelling, depending on whether or not it's going up or going down. So um, for instance, um, near the coast, you might get something called a riptide. And a riptide is whenever um, the current is actually pulling you down, which is downwelling. Um, um, so horizontal mo motion, anything, anything horizontal is current, whereas anything up or down is up or downwelling. Um, so currents are caused by three main things, tides, um, wind, and what's called thermohaline circulation, which is a really fancy um, term that I'm going to describe in a little bit more detail here. It's not nearly as complicated as it sounds. But what I've got a, um, a picture of down here is just the major currents in the world. Um, and as you can see, um, they sort of make big circles in very specific places. And we're going to um, we're going to try to figure out why exactly they make these um, very large, uh, essentially just loops in different different locations. Um, as we go, um, as you can see right off the coast of Georgia um, and the rest of the United States, the Eastern seaboard, we have what's called the Gulf Stream, which um, the reason why it's in red here is the red, the red um, ones are uh, moving warm water into colder places and the blue ones are moving colder water into warm places. And then all the black ones are just moving uh, water without changing the temperature significantly. So the Gulf Stream, as you can see, is taking warm water from the tropics and moving it all the way up along the coast, which is why the eastern seaboard has generally fairly warm water. Um, if you go over to places like uh, California, though, you might find that the water is a little bit colder. And that's actually because um, they get a lot of their water um, from a lot of their currents are coming from the north south. Um, and that just makes sense, right? There's gonna be colder water at the poles. And so if the water's coming from the poles, it's gonna be cold. And if the water's coming from the tropics, it's gonna be generally a lot warmer. So let's talk about the causes. Um, the first cause that I listed was tides. Um, so uh, a tide is what happens whenever um, factors like the moon, for instance, is pulling on the ocean to make, um, uh, to cause the tides to rise. Um, 
And so the water actually is technically bulging out slightly where um, wherever the moon is and the opposite side as well, because if it's bulging out on one side, it's gonna bulge out on the other. Um, and so as the tides rise and fall throughout the day, um, as the moon is, is circling around the earth, um, uh, they generate strong currents close to the shore. Um, so like I said, they can cause things like rip tides. So you can imagine if gravity is pulling um, water upwards, um, you're gonna get a lot of um, upwelling um, of water and you, um, you might also get um, downwelling depending on where you're at as the tides are rising and falling, it's gonna pull up or push down. So those are generally very close to the shore, these kind of tides. Um, because if you try to go out into the middle of the ocean, you're not going to notice the upwelling and downwelling nearly as much. Um, but they can cause things like riptides, um, which pull people out. Um, and um, if somebody gets trapped in a riptide, it basically is impossible for them to get back to shore easily, and they'll have to be rescued by boat. Um, and so it's actually a very dangerous situation. Um, so you got to be really careful with that. Um, another uh, factor for ocean um, currents is um, wind. Wind um, moves water close to the shore um, and is actually the reason um, why we get waves against the shore is because of wind. Um, it's close to the surface water. Um, the wind will push the water um, near the top um, and it causes waves whenever they batter against um, the shore. Um, those are pretty much exclusively caused by um, wind. Um, and it does what's, what's known as the Coriolis effect, which actually, if we go back just a bit, the Coriolis effect um, in the Northern hemisphere, um, the, because the earth is rotating, is spinning around, um, the earth is, is spinning where it's moving this way, right? The earth is moving ever um, eastward. Um, so whenever um, wind is moving, um, wind is generally moving westward um, near the pole, near the poles. And I'll have, I'll have another demonstration of this later, but um, wind is generally moving um, westward. And um, as the wind is, is moving, um, because of the fact that the earth is spinning, wind just kind of creates this big, um, these big loops um, so actually our, um, huge, our very large currents, um, a lot of them are caused, um, by wind or at least wind follows the same pattern and they're caused by other stuff as well. Um, so I had a, another question, um, the sun, does the sun affect tides? Yes. The sun actually, um, the moon and the sun both affect tides. Um, the sun, um, is not quite as strong as the moon. Um, I think it's, it's about a quarter of the strength of the moon, but, um, it does affect tides. Um, in fact, every single celestial body affects tides, the sun, the moon, the other planets, the stars really far away. It's just usually those ones are not nearly strong enough for us to really notice it. The ones that we notice are the moon and the sun because they're both close and they're both pretty strong. Um, if the sun and the moon are actually in the same place, it'll cause what's known as a king tide. Or if they're on opposite sides, it'll cause what's known as a king tide because it's really stretching. And if they're on um, like perpendicular to each other, so they're kind of canceling each other out a little bit, um, they cause what's known as neap tides, which are just very weak tides. Um, but uh, wind, wind causes waves. And also because of the way that wind moves on the earth, um, it causes, uh, uh, the tides, the currents to cycle, to make these big, essentially, I think it's called a conveyor belt by some people. Some people call it um, the great ocean conveyor belt. Um, it's kind of like a fan. Um, and the third thing that causes uh, tides is what's known as thermohaline circulation. Thermo means heat and haline means salt. So it's what happens whenever you have um, different temperatures and different salt concentrations. Um, this one generally works a little bit slower than the other two. So like tides are going to be kind of strong because they're near the shore. Um, wind pushes water pretty quickly. 
Um, thermohaline circulation is a little bit tougher of sort of a concept and it moves, it moves a little bit slower than the other two. So um, let's say that you are in a crowded room and suddenly they open up half of the room. Like there was maybe a barrier for half of it and everybody's over on one half. And now whenever they open that up, what's going to happen? People are going to start shuffling into the other half, right? Because you're trying to, people generally don't like to be so close to each other. They'll, they'll space themselves out. Um, the same thing happens with salt in the ocean. Salt will try to space itself out as best as it can. Um, and so, but because the ocean is absolutely massive, some places are going to have more salt than other places. So what happens is water, salt water will try to move into places with fresher water and uh, it'll try to even itself out. And so you'll get movement of water that way. If some parts are warm and some parts are cold because of the laws of entropy, the warm parts are gonna mix with the cold parts. So you'll get water movement that way as well. Um, so as you can imagine, that's generally a little bit slower than, than things like wind. Um, but um, that's another thing that causes um, uh, currents is just changes in density and changes in heat. Um, so um, let's talk about, I mentioned the Coriolis effect. Um, let's talk about atmospheric circulation here um, real quick. Um, so the Coriolis effect um, is essentially, you can do it. There was this great viral video a while ago where somebody had a basketball and they spun it and tossed off of a dam. And as the ball came down, it started to really spin and start to move um, horizontally. Um, and that's kind of the same thing that's happening with our entire planet. Um, our entire planet is spinning, as I said. Um, it's constantly moving eastward. It's rotating in an eastward direction, which means that um, uh, our winds tend to move westward um, near the equator um, because you've got... Um, kind of bands where you have higher pressure and bands where you have lower pressure and the high pressure is going to move to low pressure. Um, and so these winds are going to move downward. So uh, the 30th parallel, for instance, is generally considered a high pressure zone. There's more pressure there. Um, and um, so wind is going to move towards the low pressure area that is our equator. But because our earth is spinning so fast, um, the wind is going to move is going gonna, is gonna to start to, to um, move horizontally as well. It's like if you toss a, if you toss something out of the window of like a moving vehicle, um, from your perspective, it's moving straight, but um, in reality, it's moving sideways right along the vehicle, right? Um, it's kind of the same situation. So what you get is actually these really strong winds moving um, westward along the equator. And then you get what's called westerlies um, between the 30th and 60th parallel that um, spin and start to move eastward again. Um, so this happens because there are changes in humidity depending on where you're at on the earth and there's changes in heat as well. Um, so what you, what you might, um, oops, what you might notice um, is uh, like the Sahara deserts right here at this high pressure zone. Um, down here, you actually get the Namibian desert near the high pressure zone. Um, if we were to see North America, you would notice that the American deserts of the West are also right here in this high pressure zone. It's generally a very dry, high pressure area. And because of that, it will move to these lower pressure, humid areas. Um, so, um, uh, atmospheric circulation, because the wind is moving, it will affect the way that the tides move as well. And actually, you'll notice that these winds, um, all of these lines look a whole lot like if we go back um, to um, here, you'll notice that, um, you know, here, right about here's the 30th parallel. And you notice that um, the currents are moving down towards the equator. And then at the equator, they're rotating and coming right back up again. It's it follows it pretty much perfectly. So the tides and the winds and the atmospheric circulation all kind of tie into each other, which is kind of it's kind of a big thing to wrap your head around. Um, the fact that 
because our earth is so big, different areas have different pressures and it's what's causing these huge systems um, to, um, to happen. Um, and so you get these different cells where high pressure is moving towards low pressure. Um, and it causes all of these all of these things to happen. And actually it causes what's known as trade winds as well, the trade winds. Um, these Europeans had such an easy time getting this, um, to Central America because they could literally just follow these currents to Central America. Um, but whenever they got over here, they found that they had to go all the way up the coast to be able to head back because uh, they couldn't they couldn't get around. Or um, uh, these um, explorers who were trying to get over to um, here, let me go back a little bit. The um, a lot of um, explorers who were trying to get around the Cape here, the African Cape, um, they found they, whenever they discovered, whenever they figured out sort of the mechanism of currents, they figured out that it was actually easier to um, sail across to um, South America, go down the coast of South America, and then um, sail across open sea over to Africa. It was easier to cross the Cape. Instead of following along the coast, it was way easier to hop across to an entirely new continent, sail all the way south, and then and then hop over, um, which is kind of a crazy thought, right? Like they figured that out. Um, so let's talk about the benefits of ocean currents. Why does it matter? Why do we care that there are ocean currents? Well, I just mentioned one, um, it's movement. Um, ocean currents um, help uh, people to move around. Back in the age of sailing, we relied on ocean currents to get um, from one, one continent to another. Um, uh, they help us to stay connected. Um, even today, um, most, most supplies are sent by cargo ship. Um, so we rely very heavily on that. Um, animal and plant migration actually happens a lot because of ocean currents as well. Um, we get some birds um, that um, come across um, using um, ocean currents um, uh, from places like Africa to South America. They use ocean currents for that. They follow these winds, which are affecting the currents as well. It also affects climate control. Um, so uh, because we're constant, the earth is constantly trying to equalize its pressure, these high pressure areas like the 30th parallel where the Sahara is, um, and actually we're pretty close. I'm, I'm in Albany, Georgia, we're, we're on the, uh, we're pretty close to the 31st parallel. So we're pretty close to this as well. Um, uh, because these high pressure places are constantly trying to move to low pressure places, what ends up happening is you get um, warm currents moving up to colder areas and cold currents moving down to warmer areas. And it's, it's kind of like a method of central air and heating. Um, so it's, it's very important for keeping the earth regulated. Otherwise, some places would be boiling hot and other places would be freezing cold and there would be no happy medium. Everything would just be in extremes. Um, so this is a picture of the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream runs from the Gulf Coast and it runs up, um, up our coast until um, it reaches Southern Virginia. And then after Southern Virginia, it spills out a little ways um, into more central, um, the more central Atlantic. Um, the Gulf Stream is extremely important to the Eastern seaboard of the United States because it is the entire reason why we have all these swamps and, um, and uh, warm weather in places like um, North Carolina and South Carolina and even Virginia. Um, and as you can see, the warm water that's affected by the Gulf Stream reaches all the way up into Massachusetts. Um, the entire eastern seaboard has very warm uh, weather and very warm water um, because of this Gulf Stream. Um, if it wasn't for this Gulf Stream, um, your coasts, these really nice beaches that we have on the East Coast, would be completely cold. They'd be so cold. Um, so it's extremely important to us to have this Gulf Stream. You get places like the East um, Australian Current, which you might have seen in Finding Nemo. All the all the sea turtles were um, gliding across the East Australian Current, um, and uh, 
that also regulates the temperature for all of these coral reefs that are along um, the Eastern Australian continent. Um, all of these coral reefs are, are being uh, uh, regulated, their, their temperature is being regulated by this, um, this mixture of cool water and warm water that's running up and down the coast there. Um, let's talk about migration as well. Um, so um, there's a couple, there are both animals and plants that rely on currents for migration. I actually have a couple examples of plants here. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing the screen for just a minute. Um, ever seen one of these? This is a pineapple. Pineapples are originally from, we believe Peru, um, but uh, these guys actually rely believe it or not, on ocean currents to move. Um, uh, what happens is these uh, fairly tropical fruit will um, uh, end up in the water and then the ocean current will take them down the coast. And then whenever they hit um, a coast somewhere, um, the pineapple uh, seed, this is a seed, will start to grow. Um, and it will create a new pineapple plant. And then that pineapple plant will drop a seed and that seed will get washed away and it'll make its way up the coast again. And actually by the time European settlers um, were showing up in the early 1500s um, in Central America, the pineapple, even though it started all the way down in South America, was already in the Caribbean. It was already making its way up through the Caribbean. Um, and so it became something of a, of a delicacy for Europeans. Europeans would bring these pineapples back and then they would literally, it's kind of funny, um, they, um, the, these Europeans would, uh, show off their pineapples because pineapples meant that, um, pineapples couldn't really grow in Europe. So you had to get them imported all the way from the Americas. Um, and so they would rent pineapples specifically just for parties. They would rent a pineapple to just have and be like, Hey, everybody look at my pineapple. And they would never eat their pineapples because they were um, they wanted to show them off as a status symbol. If you ate your pineapple, it, it wouldn't be a status symbol. Now, I got a question a minute ago that was, um, does the ocean make the pineapple salty inside? That's an interesting question. Um, pineapples have this pretty thick, tough exterior, which makes it hard for salt water to really get inside. Um, and it's actually semi-permeable. Um, which is just a way of saying um, water can get through it and a couple other things can get through it, but salt is going to have a lot harder time getting through it. So um, no, the pineapple isn't that salty inside. In fact, if you taste it, it's remarkably sweet um, and it kind of hurts. That's because it's, it actually has an enzyme in it that um, uh, wears away flesh and meat. So technically, whenever you bite the pineapple, the pineapple bites back. I also have another example of a plant that migrates using ocean currents and it's the pineapple. The pineapple actually started all the way across in um, East Asia and over time due to Pacific ocean currents, it made its way all the way um, throughout the entire Pacific ocean. Um, the pineapple is from the pineapple, the coconut is from uh, a coconut tree which is, um, which are these really, really special trees. And actually they're called the tree of life in a lot of Polynesian cultures because every single part of the coconut tree is useful. They use the palm fronds for, um, for uh, a building. They used it as, as a rope and, and um, other things. They used the tree itself to build huts. They used the coconut for food. They um, used the, um, the stuff inside, um, uh, to help keep their uh, bodies um, is like a sunscreen. Um, they they um, got a, a lot of nutrients from it. Um, I actually have, I got a question that says, do fish eat coconuts? I have no idea. I do not know. Um, I could look that up later. Um, but humans eat coconuts um, and humans use every single aspect of the coconut. Um, the Polynesian um, people did. Um, and so that's kind of crazy. This coconut, um, wherever this coconut was, um, whenever Polynesians who were um, sailed across thousands of miles of ocean and ended up on islands in different places, if the coconut was there already, they knew they were good. So this coconut kind of is sort of a, an ambassador of civilization. 
um, whole civilizations wouldn't have been, wouldn't have existed if it wasn't for a coconut. Um, and they move because of ocean currents. Um, we're going to go back to the slideshow because um, there are a couple other examples of um, creatures that rely on oceans. Um, this big image here is actually um, Atlantic salmon. Um, they, they move around using ocean currents. Um, they get from place to place using ocean currents pretty regularly. Um, and up here in this corner is the Atlantic sturgeon. Um, sturgeon run up and down the coast and they're actually anadromous, which is a way of saying that they, um, just like the salmon, they make their way up to their breeding grounds in fresh water um, in streams and whatnot every single time that they breed. Um, and so they actually rely heavily on the currents to get back and forth as well. Sea turtles also rely on currents for migration. They, uh, you can get sea turtles that make their way across the entire world um, just by using currents to, to carry them along. Um, and um, here's a video of, um, this is what a sturgeon looks like. Um, these huge guys, they live in fresh water but then they actually also go out into the ocean and use the currents to move up and down um, the coast. Um, so that is what they look like. This is a striped bass, which also actually rely on currents as well. So um, this guy, these kind of things you can find right here in the Flint River. Um, but um, they rely on ocean currents to get themselves back and forth between wherever they're hanging out as an adult and um, wherever they're um, breeding. So that's kind of a, a bit crazy. Um, and uh, the last thing that currents are really good for is trade and commerce. Um, I have this image again, because actually um, these are all paths that um, we use for trade. Um, with the Pacific, we, um, uh, what generally happens, let's say that there's a cargo ship leaving Hong Kong, it'll come up across the North Pacific, and then it'll make its way towards the Western coast of the United States. And then it will head back down, it'll go across the equator, it might stop at places like Hawaii along the way, but it'll move that way. If we're um, trying to get from Europe to the Americas, they generally go south, and then they come across westward. Um, it's extremely important for trade and commerce. Um, so currents are extremely important for a lot of things. They're important for animals, um, for their, um, their physiology. Um, animals, a lot of different animals rely on currents. A lot of fish and a lot of um, ocean dwelling creatures rely on currents. A lot of birds rely on the wind that is causing currents and the atmospheric changes to move from place to place. Um, we rely on currents um, to uh, make our way um, across um, through the ocean um, and plants rely on currents because several plants have adapted themselves to um, spread via ocean current. A lot of um, island dwelling plants um, will. Um, so that is all I have for currents um, and, and the topic of currents. Um, and uh, I don't see any additional questions, but let's see if there are any coming in now that I'm done. Um, are there freshwater currents? That's actually a really good question. So I'm talking about ocean currents today. Um, the ocean is a salt water. Um, it's a body of salt water. But um, as I mentioned before, there are thermohaline currents, which is currents caused by differences in temperature and differences in salt concentration. Um, so whenever we think of freshwater, um, there are undercurrents in places like um, rivers and lakes and other places. So like, for instance, um, some lakes are large enough, like, uh, like Lake Superior, for instance, to actually have a current. And that current is caused by wind on the top and also by changes in temperature underneath. So Lake Superior is actually very deep. Um, so the very top is very warm. Um, and that warm water is going to try to mix with the cold water underneath. And so you will get upwelling um, within Lake Superior, which is also going to cause waves. Um, and so there are currents um, in freshwater bodies if they're large enough. Um, 
for, for things to move, but you're not gonna get thermohaline currents because there's no salt. Um, I hope that answered your question. Um, all right, well, that's all I have for currents today. I thank you for joining me and I will see you next time.